Welcome to Suzanne's studio. I'm Suzanne Barnett, your host, and tonight I have something to tell my viewers. It's the first time in a long time that I haven't been able to make up an introduction to my guest, who is Kimberly Mutu. And Kimberly is an artist, but she has so many different specialties that it would have taken like 10 minutes to rattle off her introduction. But I do remember two things. One is that Kimberly is a textile artist and a sculptor. And I am so pleased to introduce Kimberly. Thank you. I've never had this happen, but you're just too talented. <laughs> Thank you. How did all this happen? Um, I started as an artist when I was a kid. I had took art lessons when I was young. And when I went to high school, I, w I took all classes, as many as I could take. But I was told that artists uh, had to be graphic designers at the time. That was the thing. And I just didn't want to do that. And so I decided I wasn't an artist, and I quit. And I went for quite a long time not doing any art. Um, and then I slowly started working in my kids' school, helping out. And when they finally no longer needed my assistance, um, I went on and went back to school at De Anza College and got uh, AA in sculpture. And I, that was in 2012. I went back in 2008. And since then, I've been doing all kinds of things. I know. I just can't believe it. And if I started rattling them off, people would turn it off. <laughs> so yeah. we have to keep it simple. Yeah, sure. sure. So are we going to show some of your pictures to yes. begin with? Let's yes. do Why that. Yes, we do that, yeah. OK. So um, this is the first work that I made. It was called Flying Mandolin, and it was steel and uh, stone, a carving. And from there, I went on to um, the next picture is I, I, started, I learned how to do furniture design. And I started using my textiles there, and I created a maquette, which is here on the stage. But this was the large version of that same little version that I did there. This is a, a Irish chair. And you can sit in it. I mean, it's a full-size chair. It's seven feet tall. And it's all comfy and really nice. Um, and then from there, I started working in a different field um, in the next picture is uh, oh mixed media. Um, and so I created this sea anemone out of found objects. Um, and there's chicken wire, newspaper, magazines, seashells, oh, that. textiles, things like that. Is that an octopus? It is a sea anemone. A sea oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. OK, and so in the next picture, um, I then started, I was still, all during this time, I was working in steel welded sculptures. And so this was a commission that I got for a little boutique in, in Almaden. And that piece is eight feet tall. And it's morning glory. And it was all steel welded morning glories flying around sort of a, a large egg shape. Um, and then from there, for, for that first bit, I was working in steel. And then I moved into bronze. And I think the next picture, let's see. Yeah, as you go, you, we could mention all the different bronze, yeah. wood, you know. Gla yes. Yeah. And so this one oh, I um, love that. becoming, it's hard to tell in this picture, but it's um, the water lilies are growing out of a human heart, which is nestled in the base of that pe piece of alabaster. And so the, the um, morning glory is growing out of that. And there are two little um, uh, koi fish swimming around the center. And um, that took me two years. I spent a long time working on that. And I did a small things here and there around that, but that was, that took a long time. That was a big work. And then, so for up to that first four years, I was working in steel, glass, ceramics, uh, bronze, and furniture design. But all of those processes require a lot of energy, uh, a lot of use of energy, working with welding, working with, um, you know, welding machines, um, cutting, all those things. And I got to a point where I didn't want to use resources in that way. I kind of changed my direction. I went back to Boston, went to school, the School for the Museum of Fine Arts. And this was the end of my year there. Um, everything I did that year um, had to do with found objects in wood. Um, this last, this was a window that I created for a bridge, and I installed it. Um, uh, kind of a guerrilla installation for one day on the national parks in Boston. It was hanging, and then I had to take it back down before they confiscated it. Um, but that was made out of 150-year-old uh, fence posts that I found and created for this sculpture. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. And so also while I was back there, one of my interests has been um, trying to figure out a way to work with the environment. And this was a maquette that I made. It was for um, Pedix Island, which is part of Boston Harbor uh, National Parks. There are 34 islands, and they were asking artists to create things that would help um, showcase the islands or to help make, to get, bring access, um, to give um, an educational bent to the work that we were doing to help with the islands, um, promoting of the islands, because they were not very accessible. And they're still not. There's no uh, water or sewage on these little islands. And so I created, um, the idea was to have water catchment pools on each island, and the pool would be the shape of the island topography in reverse. And, and you made that table So yourself. I made that table. Yeah, that is um, the actual topography of Pedix Island in Boston Harbor. And I made it out of plaster. And it was a real learning lesson because the table weighs about 350 pounds. And it is just slightly too big to get into an elevator that I needed to get it into when I was showing it to the National Parks when we were doing our presentation. And I had to leave it in the lobby because so it's too big. So you never did get it in, into the elevator? No, I did not. Um, they had to go down to the lobby. I had to leave it in the, oh. the ground floor of the Architecture School of Architecture in Boston where we were supposed to be showing it on the big next floor up. Well, I'm so impressed, too, with uh, how you've reached out to the environment. Thanks. I think that's... Well, what haven't you done? <laughs> this, okay, oh, so I as I this. said, I started changing. Yeah. In Boston, I changed and was working um, on, well, mostly wood, although I didn't make that maquette. Um, and then when I came back to California, I started to do weavings and change the textiles because that is a, a medium where you have a lot of control. Um, you don't, it doesn't require power tools. It doesn't require special energy. And with regards to my weavings, I dye all my own fibers. And so I use plants to do the dyeing. I don't use um, like the color powder dyes, um, the chemical dyes. I use just natural um, the plants. Is that, is that difficult to do? It's not that hard, no. Um, I've been learning techniques over the last couple of years. And so this piece right here, actually, this is called Quicksilver. And in South San Jose, in Almaden, there is a park called Quicksilver Regional Park, which is where they used to do uh, mercury mining in the 1800s to the 1900s. And um, this park uh, has, um, in addition to mines, there's a lot of mercury that's leached out into the water. And it makes, you know, it's, it's a difficult area, and I wanted to bring light on that subject. And also to kind of pay homage to the women who were really running the towns there. The men were mining. The women were keeping everything else going, the food, the laundry, the children, the education, everything. And so weaving was one of the things that was very um, popular for the women who lived there at the time. So I was using all the, the same kind of materials that they would be using at that time and created this weaving, which it's hard to tell in this picture, but there's uh, mine shafts going down and down in the very bottom. It's all silver, and it's like the color of the mercury that it's leaching into the water and kind of running out the bottom of this. this How long did that piece. take? That was about two months of work. That's yeah. not bad. No. So, okay, so then um, I, it's part, another part of my artwork is um, with political issues. And so when we were in the drought in 2015, as we were at the, still at the height of the drought, um, I was doing research. A lot, I do a lot of work um, where I do a lot of research on a subject, and then I create art of, out of that research. And so with this one, I was looking at r the rainfall totals um, and in the state of California, and specifically how with the drought, we were starting to pull a lot of the water out of the aquifers in the Central Valley. And in, um, in parts of the Central Valley, so with so much water being taken out of the land, out of the aquifers, they have collapsed. And it, it's called subsidence, when the land compresses. And a section of the Central Valley, the size of the state of Connecticut, has sunk anywhere from a few feet to, in this case, um, 33 feet. And so this is a gigantic drinking straw. It's 33 feet tall. You can see um, the scientist from USGS who worked with me standing at the bottom, Michelle Sneed. And at the very top, which is out of the frame, it says the Earth's surface, 1925, and where we're standing, Earth's surface, uh, 2015. And you made that yourself. Yeah, I made that, yeah. So that was, that was for a conference. that uh, This was at the California College of the Arts. And so this is for a conference to show um, how by drawing the water out, we are changing the topography of the state of California. 
and try to bring light to that subject. That's amazing. Thank you. So I, I'm, yeah, so then, oh, this is what I shall remember at yeah. your exhibit. This, um, the work oh, that I'm doing here, that um, I, again, I do a lot of work where I do research over a long period of time, mm -hmm. and so I was walking, I live in Pacifica, and I was walking on the beach every day. And as I walked back and forth, um, I'd start my walk about seven in the morning. I would take one photograph, looking at the way the water drew a line on the beach, you know, when the wave comes in. Yeah. And the, this beach in Pacifica has really dark black sand. And um, it's a runoff actually from the Sierra, so it has a lot of the, um, the mountain, the, the, the granite that comes through all the way through the valley, through the rivers, and it finally comes out into the Pacific Ocean, and it's on our beach. So the, water, the beach is almost black. And so the water line makes this really interesting pattern each time a wave comes in. And so I would take one shot each day, and then I would create these little wooden frames, and I would use, I'd, I'd create a little loom out of a, a six inch frame and string it with um, fishing line, and then I would weave back in the line of that wave. And so this was um, 50 days of waves over the summer, two summers ago, 2000. Fifteen. And he did each. Did you make the frames too? Yeah, every day. Every, well, some. Actually, I have to say, I have to take that back. My partner yeah. John made a lot of the frames. I made some. He he actually went to the wood shop and worked and did a lot of the work on that. And then I would drill the holes and put all the fishing line through and then create the weavings. But each one is separate. So yeah. how do you remember which ones are which? I write the date on the back okay. of each one. Okay. Yeah, because each that's yeah. 50 days in a row. Yeah. So it had you know like each day I had one, so I was doing it over a series of 50 days. I think that should go to Sacramento. Well, another piece did go to Sacramento. I think if you go another couple of slides, um, yes, this piece right here is in Sacramento. It is at our state representative um, Scott Mullen, his off or Kevin Mullen, sorry, Kevin Mullen in yeah. Sacramento. This piece is. Uh, it has to do with the rainfall during the drought. So if you go across it, you'll see there's seven rows by four rows. And going from left to right, the left-hand edge is 2010, and the last row is 2016. And the top row is up in the snowpack in the Sierras, the water that goes to Los Angeles through, via the aqueduct. The second row is Fresno, representing our farming communities mm -hmm. in the Central Valley. The third row, second from the bottom, is um, Salinas, so coastal agriculture. And the bottom row is San Jose, which is our third largest city and used to be agricultural center. And so those are each tapestry, they're 15 inch square tapestries. Each one is the rainfall totals in the state of California each of those years for each of those regions. So in 2010, we had an El Nino year, and you can see a lot of blue. And the blue, the darker the blue, the more the rainfall on any given day. And as you go across to the far right, um, the center has very little blue. And that's because there was very little rain during yeah. 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15. 2016, we had another El Nino year, at least in January, February. And so you can see a lot of rain, a lot of blue in those tapestries. And I so, wonder how many other artists do it just like that. None. I don't. I don't Zero. think that many. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Well, this kind of art doesn't yeah. really sell, but it is very interesting oh, for me. Yeah. And I try and um, in my art, I try and uh, put light on things that maybe are not being noticed. And so that, this is that. And so when I had this in my studio, Representative Mullins, who um, is the representative for um, San Mateo County, he came because um, he's helped support Sanchez Art Center in the past, and so he came for a visit, and he saw this and asked if I'd give it on loan to the Capitol for yeah. one year. So it is there in the State Capitol building right now. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That is very exciting. Well, that's why I think you're so fantastic. Thank you. And you do whatever phase of art you do, it's so extraordinary. I think it must be because I'm a little hyper because I get bored with things, so I keep changing my is that fields. Is that your but, secret? But part of it is yeah. I just yeah. I started as a sculptor working in very energy intensive mm -hmm. processes, and I've moved completely away from this. This particular piece um, it was made with wool and cotton, both produced in the state of California. The wool was grown in the state of California. The cotton uh, by she, you know, was 
produce on sheep, grown in the state of California on um, very ecologically friendly farms. And, um, and then all of the color, it's the natural color of um, cotton. You know, we think of cotton as being white, but cotton comes in a, a variety of colors. We just only produce white because that's the easiest to use in clothes production. But you can get red, brown, green, um, shade, different shades of brown. So this is a natural color of the cotton. Um, um, and the wool, you know, wool comes in a variety of colors. And so this is the natural wool color as well. And the blue comes from indigo, which we grow on the California campus, uh, Cal uh, California College of the Arts campus in Oakland. And so the dye was, you know, produced locally, and so that produced the color. So it was very low water footprint, which was my goal, talking about water. Yeah, so, yeah. So. And uh, let's see what else. Um, this is this is to give you a little idea of the colors, the colors that I use now. Um, you can see the green, yellow, pinky, red, purple, more of a red to orange, um, mint, uh, uh, daisies, beets, um, cabbage, blueberries, um, onion skins, and carrots. And that produced the color spectrum that you're looking at, and that produces the dye that I use. That's some of the things that I use for dye material. How long do you have to keep it in? To I boil it for yeah. about a half an hour, yeah. and then I let it steep, yeah. and I put it into jars, and then I put the material in. If I leave it for a day, it gets really good color. Oh, It'll get color okay. right away, but if I want it to stay, I need to leave it in longer. I see. Yeah. So you're a real purist. Yeah, I've become that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Um, this is another tapestry that I created. I was um, on a residency at the Foresight Foundation up in Nevada City, and um, this is a Manzanita branch that I was given permission to take off offsite. And so I attach it to my wall at home and created a loom with the Manzanita branch. And then all of the all of the the cotton and the wool was all dyed on site in Nevada City with the plant. So it's like oak and um, manzanita, madrone, yeah. uh, kit kit dizzy, the different flowers and plants yeah. that grew on the property. And so I created all the dye up there um, on a little burner that I created up there and I made everything and then brought it back and did the weaving. So. I'm, I'm amazed, of course, I saw this exhibit. Yeah. And, when, and then when I met you, because I, I know your mom, yeah. who's also a wonderful artist. Yes, yeah, she is. She yeah, is. I have a, I I have a history where you of tech that. stuff. Her mother was an incredible seamstress and uh, fashion designer. Um, and my mom is a really incredible quilter. So it comes, I've, I've inherited a great history of it arts must, from my it family. It must be genetic, as yeah. I say that. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank and that's you. in your home? Uh, that is my studio in Pacifica, yes, oh, at the Sanchez Art Center. Okay. Yeah. And I love Manzanita. Yeah, it's, oh, so it's so gorgeous. wonderful. Yeah, and it just, it has so many twisty things. So now this is kind of a new thing that I've been working on. This is, um, I take magazines, actually Art Forum, which is a really great art magazine, which I'm sure you're familiar with. They use really high quality paper. And I cut it up and then I, I, I use uh, glue and I carefully place it and make collages out of the paper. So this is something I actually been working with children as well. I do this, I teach this in class. Collage, that's what I do. Yeah, collage. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and then I think, let's look to the next picture. Um, this is this was last summer, um, and one of the pieces is right here. Um, this is using, again, using plants to produce color. Each piece, um, they're all six inches, and I it was over again 50 days. There's a, a, a program at the Sanchez Art Center called the 5050 Show, and so this was in last uh, August 5050 Show, and so over the 50 days, I happened just out of luck, I happen to be traveling a lot. And so every day, I ha you have to make a piece of art each day for 50 days. And so with this, everywhere I went, I had silk with me, and I would gather the plants from that area, and then I would um, bundle them up and put them in a steamer, and whatever colors came off of those plants, it would create the pattern. So it was very site-specific. And so at the top, where it seems much lighter, the first two rows, the first 14, were made in New Zealand um, in June last year, but it was winter because it's below the equator. So it was the winter palette of New Zealand. And then when I returned, I went through Hawaii, so there were a few Hawaiian flowers. And then it was Pacifica in the spring, because it was at the, just the end of spring before summer. 
and then it switched into summer, and um, I was in the Southwest in Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, uh, Kansas, and so the next couple of rows came from plants from those states, and they were, it was very hot then already, just like it is here. And then the last two rows, we were in Southern California, Los Angeles, San Diego, and so it, it moves from winter to summer through the progression of those mm -hmm. 50 pieces, all with the plants. Yeah. It's so interesting how you see things. I mean, you're so exacting with the, you know, with have the squares this, and stuff. Yeah, I have this slight scientific background. Now, this is what I'm doing now, and this is what yeah. I'm really excited about. Yeah. These are 40 children at Daniel Webster Elementary School in Daly City, and this was the first day of a mural project. This is actually November 9th, which many people might re remember as a day that changed um, our perceptions in the United States. And these children were. Um, came to school that day very concerned they were going to be deported actually that was their concern and our mural was about hope and so as you look into the next few pictures we'll see what they did with that their idea of hope and how they could change the future so if you show the next shot this is oh them painting goodness. we started in november and it took till march and we worked every wednesday for about two hours every afternoon and i worked with these 40 children and we would draw every week and we would talk about like there's be, be positive, be creative, be kind, be awesome. Yeah. Their ideas of what it meant to change the future and there's, um, there's a thing on recycling, there are kids playing together. So this was the whole mural when it finished. Oh. Um, in March we had Look our dedication how, ceremony. How artistic they are. They did a great job. And so there's the whole thing. It's a 40 foot long mural and about 13 feet high. Kimberly, that and this is, is what Dilly City looks like. It's always foggy, cloudy in the fall. <laughs> no. Absolutely so. wonderful. And now, um, just last week, I did an, a camp, a week long camp. School ended on the 9th of June, and so I had a camp working with um, 15 to 18 kids. And we were, um, they were kindergartner through fourth grade, mostly kindergarten and first grade, so they're little ones. And we were doing Dr. Seuss to decorate a 90 foot wall that leads to the kindergarten rooms. So this is the kids' painting. And in the next picture, this is them every day. I would read them Dr. Seuss stories. We'd talk about what Seuss's style was, and they would draw pictures. And so they created their own Dr. Seuss characters in his artistic style. Yeah. And so we'd draw, and then the next day I'd go out and I'd stick it on the wall, and then they'd paint. So we did the background first, and then they did all of the, you know, the, the creatures, God. the little characters. And so there they are working away. That must be so satisfying. See, there's for their you. drawings. And yeah, there they oh. are. They draw with pen on the wall, and then they paint it oh. in. And so they did that. And this oh, and is look this how was the happy last day. They are. Yeah. And this is okay. So then the next three, four pictures will show the progression of this mural um, through three sceneries. And there's the third wall. If anybody's read the Lorax, you might recognize <laughs> that. And then there's oh. the full. This is the walk going to the kinder classroom at so the end. Darling. So. And that well, ends the pictures that I brought to share with you. Oh, thank <laughs> you so much. We're, we're practically ready to close this yeah. wonderful show. Mm -hmm. uh, what I w would like to ask you is, I always ask this question because yeah. everybody, you know, every artist, what, whether you're a musician, wait just a second. Yeah. What does art really mean for, for you, just yeah. you? For me. Yeah. For me, there's a couple of different parts to it. I, for me, art is something that allows you to have a feeling, express a feeling, um, feel the power, um, positive or negative, and, and it's a way to channel energy. And so I really like working, especially now with children, because a lot of children have a lot going on in their home life and a lot going on in their heads and really no way to express that. And so through art they have a chance to put into pictures maybe things they don't even know what's going on inside them or how to say them in mm -hmm. words and so I just feel it's a really powerful tool to kind of connect to the soul mm -hmm. to work um, to feel what it is inside and figure out how to you know to bring that out and and that I can see mm -hmm. coming happen through art what do you think is going to happen for the rest of your life well, I'm just going to keep on making. I'll probably keep changing uh, medium. You know, I'm doing textiles now, but who knows? Maybe next summer I'll be working in 
mosaics, or who, who knows? knows? Well, I have to I'll just do the working. same introduction. <laughs> when, when I have I you another on few again, things to my pile. Yes. I can't believe yeah. it. I'd have to start memorizing, <laughs> you know, a week in advance. Yeah. So, um, what? What is? What are your? I know they're all your favorites, but yeah. what is the most satisfying and the most fun aspect of your art that you do? The art. Well, right now, I mean. Having not gone, my, my education, my formal education is not in painting, but being able to paint on a 90-foot canvas is pretty incredible. So, and working with the kids, so doing yeah. the murals has been really great. I've yeah. really enjoyed the freedom and the size and the space of that. It's been really wonderful. Um, but working in textiles, creating natural dyes, um, and one of the pieces I didn't really, I didn't talk about at all is this one right here. Um, Using textiles to bring to 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 bring a message, like I did with um, the rainfall totals in the state mm -hmm. of California. This little piece right here shows um, a, a lake. Two versions of the lake. The center, the small blue, is the smallest profile of the lake um, in 2015, and the very outer edge of it shows what the lake is right now when we have a very heavy rain season. So showing. Mm -hmm the variety and change in our watershed and I'm going to be looking at all of the different major watersheds in the state of California and well, you're how they change. Excuse so. me, I have to close, but yeah, you, sure. you're something else. You thank really you. are. Thank I admire you, you so much. Well, thank and you, Suzanne, for I having just me here. Thank you so much for being on the show. And it's such a privilege to be with someone like you, my God. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, ha I have thank to you. have a new life to start over. <laughs> I, I hear you have a lot of a lot of artwork going on in your own house, well, so I'm thank looking you, forward but to seeing it. Not, not in the same category, but mm -hmm. all I want to say is I wish you the best, okay. and you're so talented, and the planet needs you. Well, thank you. And I, all I can say is only the best of health, okay? Thank you. And success. Thank you. Thank and you I want to thank you so much, and of course, my crew. I call them adorable. <laughs> they really are. I don't know what I would do without them. And we're all volunteers, and I thank them so much. And of course, I thank our viewers for watching. And listen to this. This I haven't forgotten. I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.